Pastor Mike Hogger coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. My wife has cancer, had cancer. There still may be a little cell floating around in there somewhere. Um, it's been probably one of the hardest things for both of us uh, to go through, and I would say definitely harder on her uh, than me, even though I probably didn't deal with it as well as she's dealing with it. She's an amazing, amazing woman. And um, had to take some pretty drastic steps in order to rid that cancer from her body. It'll kill you. It will consume and it will kill. And so I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Part of the process of what I've been going through was the, the fear of dealing with what could have been her loss. And I know, you know, we're appointed to death. I get that. And the only way, you know, short of the translation, getting us from here to heaven um, the only portal to that is through death, and I understand that. Um, death for each one of us to deal with, uh, it's not something simple. Um, you know, God put it in us to, to want to live, to want to keep going. It's, it's in our nature. Um, having been to the point of near death before in my life, um, I've told God, okay, God, that wasn't funny, and he didn't mean it that way. Uh, but the next time that you're going to, if you really mean to take me from this world to the next, I don't want to have any fear. And so, but the, the fear of someone else dying, and I know our loss is heaven's gain, but it's still our loss. And death has a sting to it. And of course, the sting of death is sin. And the theological aspect of all that I get, but still the emotional part of the fear of losing my best friend in this world, um, my marriage partner, my wife, the other half of my brain, I mean, all these things, I mean, it scared me. So when I talk about CRISPR, I want you to understand, and I'm not, I'm not just speaking as a theologian telling you, thou shalt not do this, okay? It, it, the, the prospect of what if they came up with a CRISPR cure for cancer, and that, I promise you, is coming. You know, what if they come up with a CRISPR cure for cancer, and they say to us, we have an easy fix, we give her an injection, and in one month, it will rejuvenate every cell in her body, and it will eliminate not only this cancer, but any possibility of any cancer ever invading her ever again. And all we have to do is rewrite her DNA. So part of the, part of the fear going through me is, would I be able to say to my wife, to this doctor, to myself, honey, I will see you on the other side. And to reject that cure and allow my wife to die. That's when God literally has to step in and do these things for us that we cannot reasonably be asked to do for ourselves. Uh, I was talking to a pastor, a friend of mine this morning. He's examining Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Each one of them faced death. And it was a, it was a death decided because they decided to follow God instead of doing what man tells them to do. It's the same situation. And so both, you know, both groups said, we're going to obey God. Now, God has to be in them and helping them make that decision 
or they would have each said, you know what, prayer schmear, Daniel says, I'm not going to pray. If you don't want me to pray no more, I'm not going to pray anymore. I don't want to deal with the lions. But instead, he willingly says, he willingly knows that there's a law against praying, and so he deliberately goes to his window three times a day to make sure that those people see him pray. And God has to be in you to do that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say, we believe the Lord will save us. what we believe. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to that. It's that simple. And it's not like, you know, we're not talking about something like, I'd be willing to risk my life for these five dollars I have. Nobody would do that. I'd give a guy five dollars if he needed it. If he put a gun to my head, I'd give him five dollars. But to make the decision, both for ourselves and for the people we love, to say to them, um, you're going to die because the cure is worse than the disease. And this is what we firmly stand on as Bible believers. And this is why I'm doing this series. I think it comes in a timely manner uh, because the cure is coming. The alleged cure for diseases like cancer is coming and it's going to be through the change, the rewriting of man's DNA. And that is where CRISPR decides to step in as the Savior rather than allowing God to be our Savior. You know, even while my wife is going through all this, she comes to me and hands me this magazine she got in the mail called Eating Well. And I'm like, I don't need directions on how to eat, okay? But she said, she, she um, earmarked an article in here for me. And page 75, just don't call them GMOs. And it's an article about gene editing. And she said, I figured you would like that. And I went, and so there's a part in here, and I've, I've read the article, there's a part in here um, that, really, that really got my attention concerning what we're talking about and how absolutely world-changing CRISPR and, you know, how many, th think about this, how many things out there right now are world-changing? How many commercials? How many commercials have you seen or heard or advertisements where they market a product and they say, this change, changes everything, this will change everything, everything's going to change? I mean, it's like we're being flooded with this idea of everything is going to change. And what, to me, what that is, is preparing the mindset of humanity for what is coming. And there is something, there's a lot of things coming. But how many things out there are going to be revolutionary world changers? Quantum computers, artificial intelligence, CRISPR, okay? Um, I'm going to be, I have been and will be talking about UFOs again. And those in the UFO scene, those who actually know some things that are going on, even though they have been deceived themselves by the spirit behind UFOs, they are telling you that on the day of disclosure, the reason why, one of the reasons why governments don't want to come out and say, yeah, we have a UFO locked up and we've been talking to these aliens all this time. The reason why they don't want to do that is because they know there will be panic. And they know, they know that a disclosure of that type would literally change, I mean, literally would change everything. It would change the way nations deal with themselves, it would change the way we see ourselves in the universe, it would change literally the way um, money, stock markets would crash, I mean every, religions would be altered, and I mean every religion would be altered. And so this is one of the reasons why I think it's right to tackle some of these issues is so, so that we can remain grounded in the Word of God. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, 
that as CRISPR becomes a commonplace idea to cure diseases, you're going to have very prominent pastors, evangelists, Bible teachers, quote unquote, who are going to come out and support this and say there's nothing wrong with this. God gave them the knowledge. There's nothing, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with you taking medicine. There's nothing wrong with you getting your genes edited. If it'll cure your disease, God wants this for you. And people are going to jump on it. And there's going to be very, very few who are actually going to say, don't do this. And I'm one of them. Let me show you what the article said. The article's called, Just Don't Call Them GMOs. This is on page 76. As I squatted to check out the shiny clusters of crimson fruit, I could feel the first churnings of a paradigm shift in my head. I began to wonder if the old GMOs were just an awkward adolescent state of the technology and if this latest generation of plants might indeed make our food supply more sustainable, secure, and delicious. Now, I want you to think about how many things could go wrong in this world if we start rewriting the DNA of all the species of this world. Okay? Literally, the ecosystem of a very fragile world could collapse in a very short time if mankind doesn't do this correctly. Okay? You understand you know, already we're, you know, there was a concern several years ago about bees, a shortage of bees. Why are the bees not as prominent as they used to be? And some suspected it had to do with genetically modified organisms. Bees only recognize, I mean, bees don't fly around dogs looking for pollen, right? It's because their senses, their programming, their DNA tells them to look for a certain pollen in certain places, certain weather situations, certain conditions have to be met and it's written into their DNA. Rewrite the DNA of that plant or that bee and anything could go wrong. We don't know what we're playing with. Man doesn't know this. Man's not God. God is the one who wrote the very complex book of DNA and only God knows how best to whether it should be changed or not be changed. God is the only one who knows that. Man is making all these promises to mankind about man, how man is going to make this world better by doing this. And I'm reading this article and I'm going, where's the warnings? Where is the responsible um, writer here warning the world about everything that could go wrong with editing all of the species DNA. Well, we're only making a few little, I heard, I heard this come out of my Bible college professors. Well, the changes in manuscripts really don't um, send off any uh, signals in my mind that there could be something dangerous. They don't affect any major doctrine. And I heard that, and I heard it, and I heard it, and for a while I believed it. But if God saw fit to send all the way down from heaven all of these words here, who are we to decide to tell God which of these words matter and which of them don't? Okay, and that's my point. And what I'm saying is this article here, in fact, this whole magazine, you know, besides gene added tomatoes, what else would be on our plates tomorrow? And it ends up being a multi-page advertisement for CRISPR. And it's almost like, I wonder what corporations paid money to have this article written. And we know this. We know that if you remember a few years ago, California put on the ballot that they, um, they were going to have the people vote to make it a law that if anything in the food was genetically modified, it had to be labeled genetically modified. Well, Monsanto and all these other companies show up. They spend billions of dollars in advertising to make sure that bill never got passed. Make sure it doesn't happen. Why? Because they're going to lose billions and billions of dollars. If people out of fear see a product and it says genetically modified, they're going to say, I don't want that. I don't know what that's going to do to me. That's new. I'm not going to have it. And the companies aren't going to be able to sell the product. See, 
the, the, this Bible's right. The love of money really is the root of all evil. And it's because people love money is why they want to genetically modify literally everything in this world. Because the genetic, they can't patent DNA because they didn't write it. But if they rewrote it, you can bet your bottom dollar they're going to patent it, and they have been, and they are going to continue to do that. It's like the King James Bible. Outside of the United Kingdom, there is no restriction and there is no copyright. There's no royal letters patent, which is, exists inside the UK. And inside the UK, both Cambridge and Oxford universities hold the patent, the royal letters patent, to the King James, and only they have the right to issue copyrights for it. It's already been adjudicated that they can't change it. Only the king, only the monarchy in England, I like this, only the king or the queen in England can alter the text of the King James Bible or allow its alteration. Okay, Cambridge and Oxford can't do that. Outside the United States, there is no copyright. And so your Thomas Nelson Publishers or your Zondervan Press or your any of these other groups, um, Holman Publishing, the Southern Baptist, and you want to make millions off of copywriting the Bible, but you can't copyright the King James, so you rewrite it. And you have to rewrite it in such a significant way so that it is significantly different from what's already out there. In other words, the King James. So the Holman, get this, Southern Baptist holds a copyright on the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which means that it itself is significantly different from the New American Standard, the New International Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New King James, and all of the other, the English Standard Version, uh, today's Living Translation, and so on and so on, which means that each and every translation of the Bible is uniquely different than all of the others because of copyrights. It's so that they can collect the money and keep it as opposed to collecting money and handing it out. The love of, and that's the reason why the, the Southern Baptists decided to come up with their own translation. Holman Publishing was publishing for years. They published and used the King James, no copyright. Then they switched to the NIV. Now they got to pay Zonovan Press to use the NIV. So they said, forget that. We'll just come up with our own. So they came up with their own so they don't have to pay anybody now to print their own Bible and their own, in their own Sunday school literature and other literature that they use. So it really is the love of money that's driving this. Let's get into the scriptures. Daniel chapter 2. This is sort of where we all left off last time. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And, you know, understandably, for a long time, Christians don't really understand the implications of that because we know that a man is not a dog and a dog is not a man. We know that a man is not a chimpanzee or a gorilla and an ape is not a man. That was what was known. And so to mingle yourselves with the seed of men, we don't understand how that can happen because I'm sure, in fact, we, we have laws in the Old Testament forbidding humans from copulating with animals expressly forbidding that. I don't need a law to tell me that, but God put it in there multiple times, four or five that I'm aware of, where he told them, don't do this, okay? And so for years it doesn't make sense. Now all of a sudden it does. God said, don't mix them together. It's an abomination. So man decides, to not listen. And whoever they are wanting to mingle themselves with the seed of men, now we understand that it's possible. 
And now we're starting to understand, really, that it's probable. And all the dire warnings about CRISPR from three years ago, that's old news. So we're doing it now. And check this out. Here's a, a recent article. It just ethically scares me. Caution urged as scientists look to create human monkey chimeras. Some Alzheimer's researchers are proposing the creation of human monkey chimeras, part human beings, talking about the monkeys, with entire portions of the brain entirely human derived. Okay, think about this. So you believe in evolution. You believe that man came from monkeys, lower forms, right? So what are we trying to do now? In, you know, invasion of the planet of the, of the apes? Is that what we're trying to do? We're we trying to go back now and maybe add some monkey DNA to humans because we just came out of that according to evolution. Why are we wanting to go back? Or are we trying to elevate the monkeys? Oh, we're doing it for Alzheimer's. You know, my grandmother died from Alzheimer's. It's a terrible death. Death is going to slay us all. Something is going to kill every one of us. And it is appointed unto man once to die. People don't want to die. They don't want to serve God, but they don't want to die either. So they say, let's see if we can cheat death. Here's, here's some, some of what this article had to say. I have it highlighted. The search for a better animal model to stimulate human disease has been, quote, a holy grail. Think about that. Of biomedical research for decades. Yale University researchers write in a new book, on the science and ethics of chimeras. The article goes on to explain that others are implanting monkeys with fragments of human brain tissue extracted from people who died with Alzheimer's. Now, however, some are going further and proposing the creation of human monkey chimeras, part human beings with entire portions of the brain, like say the hippocampus, entirely human derived. For Munoz, the idea of biologically humanizing large portions of a monkey's brain is seriously unnerving. He said, quote, to be honest, it just really ethically scares me, he said. He believes in animal research as a fundamental way of understanding how the brain works. However, for us to start to manipulate life functions in this kind of way without fully knowing how to turn it off or stop it if something goes awry really scares me. However, in a new book on the science and ethics of chimeras, Yale University researchers say it's time to explore cautiously yeah right the creation of human monkey chimeras the search for a better animal model to stimulate human disease has been a holy grail biomedical research for decades they write in chimera research the holy grail you remember that years ago i talked about when the da vinci code came out i did some research on what exactly the holy grail was according to not just Dan Brown, but a lot of others. You know, when you study the ideas of a cult, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no stone to stand on. There's no firm foundation. It's all waves of mishmash of fluid doctrines that change from time to time. And even the phrase, holy grail, what does that even imply? It's the idea that there is some magic in the, the idea is that Joseph of Arimathea captured the blood of Jesus as it oozed out when he was on the cross and that in that blood is some magical potion that makes man live forever. Well, they corrupted it, but essentially that's the idea. Man can live forever through the blood of Christ by way of the New Testament. It is the blood of Christ that washes our sins away. But to the occult, the Holy Grail is finding the cure to end all disease and to cure death, to eliminate death completely off planet Earth so that man can enjoy hundreds, if not thousands of years of life. And by the way, let's push off into space while we're enjoying this life. Here's what the Bible says about this holy grail. Luke 22, 20. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament 
in my blood, which is shed for you. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So stop right here. So basically, the New Testament is what gives us this eternal life. This is our fountain of youth right here, reading the Bible and believing it. But people don't want to do that. So let's come up with our own Holy Grail. Let's come up. Oh, by the way, we're going to need some assistance from spirits, which is exactly what the fourth kingdom is all about. Principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Do you think the idea of DNA editing just suddenly came to them just out of nowhere? I believe it was demonically satanically influenced. The idea of questioning, deleting, and adding to God's Word, the first person to ever come up with that idea was the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. And so Paul says this, and he's now talking about the cup of the New Testament, how it gives us everlasting life and it's the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of Jesus Christ. So this is what he says later on, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Choose one. This is exactly why God expelled Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. They had already partaken of the forbidden fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God says, you can't pick both, which is what man wants. Man wants, this is why he reforms religions. Man wants to keep his sin, whether it's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or pride. And religion is an elevator and lifter of man. So man reforms religions and rewrites religions so that he can keep his sin and have everlasting life along with it. You can't do it. My mother always told me I couldn't have dessert until I ate what was on my plate. I'm an adult now, so now I can decide that maybe I'll just eat dessert. And, and then that always causes me problems with blood sugar now. Anyway, but my mom was right. And Paul says you cannot, you cannot eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life simultaneously. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, which is the Holy Grail, which is, in this case, gene editing. You cannot have both. Choose one. Choose one. And here again, that choice may prove to be the most difficult choice of your life, but I promise you, you choose the Lord's cup and it will be the best choice throughout eternity. Here's another article. Chinese scientists have put human brain genes in monkeys and yes, they may be smarter. A quest to understand how human intelligence evolved raises some ethical questions. And this is where they are wrong. Now I'm gonna get in, the last time we were um, talking about this, I mentioned a video that really grabbed my attention. And I'm gonna start showing you little pieces of it. I'm not gonna show the video clip. YouTube might throw a fit. So I'm gonna show you little screen captures of it and show you what they're saying in this video. I'll try to remember to put a link to the video so you can watch it yourself. But it really, it really got me. This has gone from being a fringe of science to the focus of science. This has gone from being one biologist's theory to literally a multi-billion dollar worldwide industry. The quest to come up with the first genetic 
alteration that will cure cancer or cure Alzheimer's or cure the recent one was sickle cell. And oh, by the way, yes, I get an article the other day. They gene edited a guy to cure him from sickle cell. You know what they used? to drive into every one of his genes the genetic alteration. See, if you edit one gene, or you edit genes in one cell, you may have to wait a long time before that one cell duplicates to take over the whole body. We don't want to wait that long. So let's push this forward. Again, when it comes to evolution, even evolutionists say it takes millions and millions of years to make one positive genetic alteration so that the species continue to live. It's not feasible. We don't want to wait that long. We're impatient. Let's do this the fast way. So in the case where they technically cured this guy's sickle cell, they used the HIV virus, which is a very aggressive virus they just genetically altered the HIV virus so that it doesn't give him HIV, but it does quickly rewrite every cell in the man's body. Okay? So we're taught the idea of evolution anyway is, if you believe the Bible, wrong. We did not evolve. We were placed here, and not by UFO aliens either. We were placed here by a loving God who created and fashioned man in his very own image. It's the reason why we don't look like monkeys and dogs and pigs and everything else. It's because that's not who God is. We were made in God's image, and we were made, I'm going to show you a verse in a minute, it says we were made for a specific reason. And if God, and if that's God's reason, what right do we have to change it or to alter it in any way? Now, the video I saw is from a company called Ginkgo Bioworks. And their website says, producing rose oil from yeast sounds like something from a sci-fi novel. Rose, rose oil, roses, are not yeast, and yeast is not, they're not roses. Let me show you something that just really stands out to me in my very old King James Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, there's a word here, and it's the word, yeah, I see it in verse 21. God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. I see it in verse 11. Uh, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. You see, God made one tree after its kind. Then he changed the DNA and made a different tree after its kind. And then he changed the DNA and he made a different thing altogether. He started making animals, fish in the sea, cattle on the ground, man. And even though DNA works pretty much the same in all of those species, the way that DNA is written determines what species it is and what kind it is. If you remember from your high school biology, your fourth grade biology, you have kingdom, is it animal or plant, phylum, class, order, family. I, I like this. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, seven. Okay, we are of the species and genus Homo sapien. The sapien means he can think about himself. Okay, he is a thinking being, standing upright on two legs. And there were seven of them. That just stuck out to me as being the handiwork of God. Even the classification system just seems to model who God is. 
And God made each one of those creatures after their kind. And even when he destroyed it all in the flood, he didn't just say, Noah, you and your wife get on the ark. I'll figure out a way to make trees out of you after it's all over with. He didn't do that. He said, come in to the ark, bring in. I'm going to send you a sample of every living creature that walks on the earth so you can preserve that seed until after the flood. Because God himself wasn't going to alter the genetics of one species just to make all the others. God made them separate for a reason, and they're his reasons. He's the one that wrote it. So the idea of producing rose oil from yeast for the last thousand, several thousand years, no one even considered that because it was impossible. Now, it's possible. And since we've opened that door now, species rewriting is going to take place. When I say that, I didn't, I didn't talk about this, what the guy said in the article. He had a paradigm shift in his head. And what that means is, it's like when something happens and you have a discovery that makes you rethink everything you ever thought before. It's like when the Holy Ghost shows up to you and convinces you that you're a sinner. Okay, everything you thought about God in the Bible now is not stupid anymore. It makes sense because God changed you. Okay, he renewed you in knowledge by giving you his word. Okay, or September 11th, 2001. That was a paradigm shifting day for a lot of people. Okay, it woke them up. It, uh, 2000, September 10th, uh, 2001. We don't want anybody reaching into our pants at an airport. After that, we don't mind. It changed our thought. When these angels start getting expelled out of heaven and they're falling to the earth, I promise you that's paradigm shift. Okay? God calls it strong delusion and they're going to believe that lie. But that's exactly, and that's what a paradigm shift is. It's going to cause, it's, it's going to rewrite every religion, every political thing in the world, all the banking, everything literally is going to change on the day of strong delusion. And that's what this company is all about. The company called Ginkgo Bioworks, here is um, part of the video. It's a picture of their lobby, Ginkgo Bioworks, the organism company. Guess what they do? They make organisms. The narrator says, inside this advanced foundry, biologists, software engineers, and a fleet of automated robots are working side by side to crank up the speed of nature. And again, it's this idea that God didn't create us, we evolved. We, didn't, we just came from nowhere. We're an accident floating around in a vast universe of happy accidents. That's what they believe evolution is. And so since there is no God according to them, and since everything evolved and we know it did it slowly, we're not going to wait for that. We're, we now have it in our power to speed up a process that never happened to begin with, but to speed it up nonetheless, because they believe it did. They believe they have the right they know they have the power. They have the money. They just need to push a little bit farther to make sure that governments don't stand in their way and that people buy into this. And that is exactly what's going to happen. So they use the word nature. They don't like the speed of nature. And they're in the business of changing nature itself. Let me tell you where that comes from. It comes from a mind 
not shaped by God. Romans chapter 1, Paul says in verse 18, and I'm setting up the next verse here. Paul says in Romans 1, 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. That's what I believe. I believe everybody, I believe God shows them at some time. They dismiss it, but I think God shows it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And because of this, God then gives them up. He turns them over. He, before, he placed restrictions, like at the Tower of Babel. Let's confuse them so they don't do this. Before, he placed restrictions. When God gives somebody over, he removes the restrictions. You see, I don't sit and think about what it would be like to be in bed with another man. I, I don't want to think that. I don't want to ponder that. I don't want to try to find out what that's like. I don't want anything to do with it, period. Okay? That's because God put a restriction in us as separate genders. My desire is to be with my wife. My wife's desire is to be with me. And we don't sit and think about what it would be like to be in bed with a bunch of other people, including those of our own gender. But when God gives somebody up, he turns them over. And it's not just the gender issue. It's he removes the restrictions of a lot of things so that now they don't have a problem with it. So Romans, that was the setup for Romans chapter 1, verse 26. Look at what Paul said about nature. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is, look at it, against nature. You know, there's a reason why I wear short hair. I don't want long hair. It is in my nature, and I've always been this way. I grew up in the 70s when every kid, every guy had long hair. I didn't want it. I wanted my hair short. The shorter, the better, probably. My wife's different. She wants her hair long. That's nature. That's what God wrote into us. Does not nature itself teach you? It's a shame for a man to have long hair. So I, I wouldn't want it. So God wrote into each species its nature. Dogs, dogs know this. Dogs don't mate with pigs. Pigs don't mate with dogs. Even the species know this. Eagles mate with eagles. Robins mate with robins. Dogs mate with dogs. Cat with cats. The species know this. The bees know this. The trees know this. It's the humans who don't. So God gives them over to do that which is against nature. Nature says that roses produce rose oil. I guess, I'm assuming roses produce rose oil. Never looked into it. And yeast produces yeast. So now we have a company that can generate rose oil from yeast. And more than likely, according to them, they'd probably be able to do it better, faster. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, I've read things and heard things about people trying genetically modified foods. Oh, how they taste better. And it just seemed to fill me up. It seemed to give me more energy. See, man thinks he can do what he does better than God. And that's what this is all about. Man being not just equal to, better than God. Um, there was a graphic showed up in this thing. You know, I always look for the symbols. Symbols to me speak volumes. And at one point in this video, 
this symbol showed up, focal point. I've got a big arrow pointing to it. Two concentric circles joined together so that it forms a third symbol in the middle of it. Usually, and that's called a mandorla, which is an Italian word for almond. An almond is a symbol. The almond shape itself is a symbol. It's a symbol for the female. I won't get into that. But the, the joining of the two concentric circles is exactly what Daniel 2.43 is all about. They, an iron kingdom, mingling itself with the seed of men, which is clay, and iron and clay don't mix very well together, if at all, but it's the idea of these two kingdoms joining themselves together, these two groups joining themselves together. You see that symbol in a lot of things. I won't get into all that today. I want to move on. But that's what got my attention was this idea, this focal point of this is rewriting DNA. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. It's like the square and the compass of Freemasonry, the yin and yang. Any two things joined together, like a handshake or anything like that, is two things joining themselves together. And that's what Daniel 2.43 is. They completely separate entity, an alien, in the true sense of the word, that they are not from here, joining themselves and mingling themselves with the seed of men. When God sent Israel into the promised land, he told them, don't mingle yourselves with those people. You're up against seven nations mightier than you are. Don't let their sons marry your daughters. Don't let your sons marry their daughters. Don't let it happen. That is exactly what Israel did. Let's move on. At one point, the video says, Nature's had billions of years of trial and error to engineer biology and select its best designs. Nature. And they describe nature as some unknown force that has put this old world together the way it is. And they're saying, we've let nature now run its course. We're tired of waiting. Nature's had billions of years of trial and error. And see, that's the thing that always got me about evolution is, if it took millions of years of trial and error Where's the bodies of all the errors? You know, they pull out a fragment of a skull that belonged to an ape, an extinct ape, and say, this was man 4.5 million years ago, okay? And it took millions of years of trial and error to get man to where he is now. Where's all the trial and error bodies at? Where's all the deformed, where's all the deformed species whose bodies should be laying everywhere that we don't find anywhere? What we find in the fossil record are perfectly formed species that worked. We don't find the errors laying around. Anyway, nature had billions of years of trial and error to engineer biology, but it wasn't nature. It wasn't nature doing what she wanted. It's the opposite. 1 Corinthians 15, 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. Of course you don't like how you turned out. God did that for a reason. God meant it that way for a reason to please Him, to draw you to want something better. And God's got it. God has it, not man. It's in God, not medical science, not bioengineering, not CRISPR, not technology, not quantum computers, AI. It's in, not in any of that. It is in God and in the Word of God. Man doesn't want that. So man turns his back on that. But God gave me the body that I have for a reason. Some stuff works, some stuff doesn't. And I don't like it. I haven't liked it for several years now, although I used to take a lot of pride. 
Now I don't. And with what my wife has gone through, I've said at a couple points, I don't want to live down here anymore. I hate this world. I hate what it does. I hate cancer. I hate what it does. I hate it all. God, take me home. Well, I'm still here. You know why? Because that's God's pleasure to leave me here one more day. So I'll do it. Whatever God wants, as far as I'm concerned, he gets. But man doesn't want that. Look in uh, Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God, the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. So I guess, you know, global warming made it not rain back then, right? No, it was God. God didn't allow it to rain. God didn't allow it to rain until the flood. And God wanted roses to be roses, and God wanted bees to be bees, and He wanted man to be man, He wanted dogs to be dogs. God made them and gave them the bodies that pleased God. He didn't ask us our opinion. He didn't ask the angels their opinion. He made the, those, if you look in Ezekiel 1, those angels are funny looking. Uh, Isaiah 6, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. I mean, even the idea that the Lamb, Jesus, in Revelation 5 has seven eyes, that's a little different than what I'm used to seeing. But it's all according to the pleasure of God who made it, not man. We sing a song called, This Is Our Father's World, created by Jesus Christ himself. But now we have a new creator and thus a new savior. Here it is right here. Notice this. This is from the video. This is what they narrate because every living thing is built from a unique set of instructions that come down to just four letters. A, C, G, and T. It's the DNA that designs what the microorganism does. It's the DNA that designs what the organism looks like, how it acts, if it will grow, if it will not grow, it all comes down to DNA. And in that, they're absolutely right. What is it, I've been saying this, what is it that's governing the functions of my body right now? My DNA. The book that God wrote. Psalm 139, 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So in that, they're right. Everything, how an organism works, how it grows, how it doesn't grow, what color it is, how many offspring it produces, that's all regulated by the book that God wrote called deoxyribonucleic acid. And in DNA, you remember you have the two rungs of the ladder and you have the four base pairs. Just like the book that we have here. Here is... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right here. Old Testament, New Testament. And these, here's, here's the one rung of the ladder, here's the other rung, and here's the four base pairs. And where's the Word? It's here, in the four Gospels. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the body that God gave Jesus was the exact body that he wanted him to have. The exact one. He came out of the exact virgin that he wanted him to proceed from. From the exact lineage, the exact tribe, the exact people, at the exact time. Everything was ordained by God. And even Jesus himself, I'm getting ahead of myself. And lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. 
So watch this. Now here's, here's what really gets me. I go back and I look at this. And I say it, it all comes down to just four letters, A, C, G, and T. It all comes down. See, everything in the Bible is about this right here, the gospel. It's in the Old Testament, in type, in shadow, in symbol. It's in the New Testament, in, in, in Old Testament prophecy, the New Testament in doctrine. And the two work together to give us what's right here in these four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The story of the birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, think about it. Here's what, here's what CRISPR represents. CRISPR represents a different one of these. You see, because here's the Word, and the Word really is what determines, we've already said it, it's what determines everything. In our church, it's the Word that governs our church, and it governs all of its members. And if somebody don't act right, they can't be members, because they're not acting according to this. Okay, you see what I'm saying? And so when they say we're going to rewrite and restructure, re, just re, let's just move these letters around, A, C, G, and T, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. Let's just do something different with these. Put them in a different order. Putting them in a different order is what makes the amino acids, which are the 22 letters, just like in the Hebrew Old Testament, the 22 letters, the Hebrew alphabet, rearranging the letter. How do we get different words? Rearrange the letters. Different words mean different things. God both says what He wants to say, and He created what He wanted to create. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it, stop right here. There's a, that word founded, you know what it means? You know what a foundry is? It's where they manufacture things. And this case here, he hath founded it. It's God's handiwork, God's factory. He hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Who would dare to stand in the place of God and recreate what God himself has made? And see, that's the thing. If you don't believe the Bible, you believe in gene editing. But if you do believe God's Word and believe that God wrote it and that God wrote all of our DNA, you don't believe in gene editing because you don't believe in Bible editing. People take out of the Bible what they don't like. That's exactly now where they get it from. They got it from theologians. CRISPR came from theologians who said we can take out of the Bible whatever we don't like. And they're still doing it. Psalms 40, verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And in Paul quoted that in Hebrews 10. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Which is exactly why God gave you the body right now that you don't like. Maybe you have Alzheimer's, or maybe you have cancer. Maybe you have rheumatoid arthritis. That's genetic. Or maybe you have any number of different things going wrong with you. That's the point. God gets us to realize this world is not my home. I have a better one. And oh, how I want that one. Believe me. I want it for me. I want it for my wife, my family, and all the people I love and care for. 
I've already given some people that I love into the Lord's hands. And as hard as that was, I stand willing to offer up everybody that I love to God's gentle hands for Him to do with as He pleases. I trust Him. I don't trust man. David himself, when judged by God, given a choice to fall into the hands of man or fall into the hands of God, he said, God, I pick you. I don't trust men. Should we? Should we trust science? Should we trust science industry? Should we trust government regulation and oversight? Who then oversees the government? Do we not know that pharmaceutical companies have way too much control over the Food and Drug Administration? Absolutely. We're supposed to think that they're separate. I don't believe that anymore. So the world and creation belongs to God, not man. Man wants to be God and he wants to be... And see, that was um, in the movie Rampage. You get about halfway through the movie and you have Dwayne Johnson and the leading lady, I can't remember who she was. This is after the planes crashed. And so there's the action part of the movie has died down and now we're gonna have a conversation. And he finds out really what's, why she's involved in this. Because she was a scientist working for that evil company that you know, brings down the genetic alteration from the heavens, remember that? This is what I've been saying. You find out, she says this, I realized CRISPR could save my brother. I only had to hear that once in that movie, and it hit me. CRISPR the Savior, almighty CRISPR, which basically CRISPR then is man. Because we're not allowing some little one-celled organism, a bacteria, to figure out what genetic alteration it needs to make. We're the one programming the genetic alteration. We're just letting the bacteria do the hard work for us. We rewrite the DNA to suit us so that man now becomes his own Jesus Christ. Remember, they said it's all about what's right here in these four. And I agree. And that's why I think Paul warned us four times about another gospel. He says in 2 in Corinthians 11, he warns us about another Jesus as well. So the video then goes on to say, this all sounds like they're making GMOs, and you'd be right to make that association. But instead of engineering wheat by adding or tweaking a specific gene to make it more drought resistant, for instance, synthetic biology has the potential to turn that into something totally different. You see, this company, Synthetic Biology Company, they actually have a library, a repository samples of freshly written DNA. Completely new organisms just waiting to jump in and add something to some species DNA where CRISPR or man took something else out. They've already got so, I, mean, I never really thought about this, but somebody did. Let's start a company and let's start writing DNA. That way we hold the patents on it. So when some company calls us and says, hey, we want to add such and such to this genetic structure. We've already got that. We already got patent on it, we'll give you the license, which means you pay us, we already own it. It's like what happened in the dot-com days of the 90s. Companies figured out that the internet wasn't going away. Well, some people already figured out what it took corporations years. One guy went out and bought the website 
PepsiCola.com. I'm making that up, but that's an example of what happened in the 90s. So when PepsiCola finally comes along and says, we want a website, they say, uh, you can't have that. Somebody already owns it. And the guy did it on purpose. And he said to PepsiCola, I'll sell it to you for a million dollars. Okay? So then they pushed Congress to pass a law, you can't own a website if you don't own the product. Okay? But that's what's happening. So now we have a company that's already written into the thousands of different DNA combinations so that one company calls and says, we want such and such, they say, we already have it. Or we can make that for you, we'll have it done tomorrow because they have the machinery, the power, and CRISPR is just that good to be able to do that. And how CRISPR works is the genetic alteration, literally, and this is what they found out about the bacteria that they use. Bacteria, I won't get into the explanation of it, but basically they literally cut out using an enzyme the part of DNA that they don't like. That was what we just read. They cut, copy, edit, paste, and so on. They completely cut out an old part of DNA, toss it aside because they don't want to hear it. It's not what they want. We want something new. And that's already been done. Jeremiah chapter 36. We have a story of a man who used a knife to do exactly that to what God wrote. They went into the king into the inner court, and they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and told all the words in the ear of the king. So the king sent Jehudi to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elisha, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudi read it in the ears of the king, in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass when Jehudi had read three or four leaves. How many Gospels are there? He cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the hearth that was on the hearth. And you need to understand, this is a picture of Christ. Because after, he's in the four Gospels, right? Okay, and they read three or four leaves. He cuts it. Cast it in the fire. Jesus, when he died, went to the lower parts of the earth for three days to preach to those spirits in prison. Okay? But the bigger sense is he doesn't like what God said in the rolled up scroll. Similar to man looking at DNA. I don't like what's there. So let's cut it and get rid of it. And that is exactly what this king did. So... God being the God that he is said, you know, I saw that. Here's what I got to say about that. Verse 27, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that, the king had burned the roll and the words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying, take thee again another roll. Write in and all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. And in verse 32, then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Uriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. That sounds oddly familiar to me. The fact that Jehoiakim the king didn't like it, so he cut out what he didn't like, cast it away. I'm trying to get this, my Bible's too big here. I'm trying to get to the last book. Revelation, I had it in my hand. Very last thing written in the Bible, the very last thing written in the Bible is a warning to anybody who would do what Jehoiakim did. See, when Jehoiakim did this, God said, fine, that doesn't take my word away. So, Jeremiah, have Barak the scribe write these words down, and oh, by the way, I'm going to add some more to it, and he's not going to like it. And that is exactly Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 
any man shall take away from the words of the book of the, this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Very stern. And that's how I started this series out, was reading that. The warning that God gave to anybody who would take a knife, whether it's a pen knife, a pair of scissors, a new translation, or CRISPR, and edit out of God's book what they don't like. God says, I'll add. And God added the whole New Testament after Jeremiah. He wasn't kidding. You can't just cut out and think that the Creator is going to be okay with that, because He isn't. Another clip from this video, thinking of cells as programmable machines is a convergence of biology and engineering. Programmable machines. Taking these four letters, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and rewriting them to suit whatever we want. It makes man the savior. It makes man the Christ. You see, Christ is the savior in these four books, this whole book. Man wants to become his own savior through CRISPR, through AI, through all these other things, but it's man's doing. It's not just man making God in his image. It's man making man into God. So we have Luke 21. And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. And that's exactly what CRISPR makes these companies who do this, rewriting the biology of every living species, they become the creator, they become the Christ. Rewriting man's DNA so that man doesn't die anymore. That's the role of the Savior, Jesus Christ. So man comes and says, I am Christ now because I can become my own savior. Man making man God, man making God into whatever he wants him to be instead of who God already is. And let me tell you something. I've known God most of my life. There's nothing wrong with him, nothing. My savior Jesus Christ, there's no flaw in him either. The Holy Spirit, my guide, has never led me astray. I have no reason to give up this faith that I have, both in God and His Word. I have no reason to give it up. I find no fault. I'm like Pontius Pilate. I find no fault in this man. And there isn't. When I started watching this video, there was something that really grabbed my attention toward the beginning of it. And I showed you this earlier, but I'm going to close with this. Remember what, how, what we've found in Psalms about God founded it upon the seas. And what that means is a foundry is it's a manufacturing facility. It's where they make things. God made us. Now we're going to remake man. And so inside this advanced foundry, it's an organism manufacturing facility. Biologists, software engineers, and a fleet of automated robots are working side by side to crank up the speed of nature. And it dawned on me that that word is in Scripture, not just the one we found in Psalms where God founded it upon the seas. He made it upon the seas. But he's describing what man does. Man becomes a founder, but what does he make? Jeremiah 10 verse 14, every man is brutish in his knowledge. You know what that 
You know what that means? Brutish. You remember Bruto from Popeye? He was always this big, hairy guy. It means he's a beast. A natural, brute beast. Beast nature. Think of no other thing to do but destroy God. So every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder, look at this, every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. Jeremiah 51, 17, every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there's no breath in it. God says it twice here in the book of Jeremiah. Same thing. Every man is brutish by his knowledge. The founder, the founder, the man who makes is confounded by the graven image. The graven image, of course, all points to Revelation 13 where everybody gets together and they make this image of the beast, but this image of the beast speaks and causes everyone as would not worship the beast to be killed. It causes every man to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. But this foundry that they described is a founder of a false God and a false Savior. Making a false God out of man by making or attempting to make man immortal. It's all guided by what John referred to as the spirit of Antichrist that is already working. Now again, it's been a rough month been a rough year. But this last month in particular, it's been hard. And the fear, literally the fear, just in talking about CRISPR and what it can do, part of me says, I want my wife to live. I don't want her to die. I'd be willing to do anything for her. And I've told her that. Except Except let man destroy. You see, Jesus told us, don't fear the one who can kill the body. Fear the one who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So you can imagine, I've spent a lot of time in prayer a lot of tears, begging God not to let me fall for what's coming in this world, and begging God to help me trust Him. And I promise you people, trusting God is about to get harder on us. I hate to scare you, but I have to be sober. It's about to get harder for us. But I promise, and see, that's a filter. God uses that as a filtering mechanism because there's a lot of people who say they trust God. God knows they don't. And when he puts them to the test in the trial, it'll, it'll be known who does and who doesn't. And this is why I say when things are going okay is when you pray, God, whatever it takes, don't let me fall, whatever it takes. I have it in me to do it, don't let me do it. God, you hold on to me tight. And I really mean this. At the end of our lives, no matter how long or short, we'll have looked back seeing that it wasn't us holding on to God. It is God holding on to us. It's not us floating the ark. It's the ark holding us in. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Because Christ is that ark. Give you a lot to think about, a lot to pray about. Hope you've enjoyed it. Don't be afraid. I'm saying this because I'm afraid. Don't be. 
Okay? It won't do good things for you. Trust God. Trust His Word both here and here. And trust that God always, and this is something that God's brought me back around to throughout all of this, God always knows what He's doing. The cancer they found in my wife was no bigger than the tip of this pen, which you can't even see. How they found it, I have no idea. It had to be a miracle of God. See, God could have allowed her to not get cancer at all. He allowed her to have it so that he could prove himself in a much better way than he ever has before. And for that, I'm not sorry that he did it. I'm thankful. You're the reason why I do what I do. I love you. I want you to know that. I'll continue to be here as long as the Lord allows me. May the Lord bless you. God, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. God bless you. Bye-bye.